Well, this week on the OHL podcast, an opportunity to catch up with a guy that I've been seeing around rinks for almost as long as I've been traveling to them. Jake Grimes, former head, or pardon me, assistant coach with the Belleville Bulls, Peter Ropitz, Guelph Storm, and now back in U Sports, kind of where it all began, full circle sort of thing for you. But Jake, as always, uh, appreciate your time. Thanks for joining me. Hey, awesome to be here. Looking forward to the chat. One of my favorite things about talking to guys who now have kids in the game is checking in on them first. How's Dixon doing? Doing well. He's in a team that's been in a rebuild situation. He's out in the Quebec League and uh, with the Charlottetown Islanders. Um, Jimmy Halton coaching, who's a familiar name for us here in Ontario. And uh, when I was out there in Cape Breton, uh, you could just see what a great ship that he ran there and it's around. So um He's been trying to get into the CHL, Dixon has, the COVID year, and, and it just kept working. And he finally made it in at 19 uh, with the Storm, had a, had a decent half year, and then found more opportunity out in the Quebec League and went up there. So he's he's had a chance to play in, in these great leagues, and I'm happy for him. I always find it interesting that guys that have played in the leagues, such as yourself, don't dissuade necessarily their kids from doing it. There must be some merit in joining or coming through this league. Well, there is, and it's, and there's still a ton of respect. So, I mean, some of the guys you may have talked to or whatever had seemingly had fantastic careers coming through, but we all know as coaches how tough it is. And um, yeah, so it's, it's, there's a ton of respect and uh, it's, you know, the OHL, let's say the greatest league in the world for their age. So speaking of the Q and, and down East, I'm always fascinated by these stories as well. How does a guy from Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, end up in the Ontario Hockey League like you did? Yeah, it, it is a neat story. So first of all, growing up in Dartmouth, Halifax area, um, uh, no Quebec League presence at that point. So when it's draft time, me and my buddies or whoever were eligible or there was interest in would be sent a letter and you check, do you want Western League, Quebec League or Ontario League, so that only one of the leagues drafts you. A couple of years before me, it was a free-for-all, and guys could be drafted in the Quebec League, let's say second round, but the Ontario League third round, if someone lost a real big pick, you can only go to one of those teams. So they controlled it that way. So I chose Ontario, got drafted by the Belleville Bulls, and it all it all started that way. So I played three years with the Bulls, uh, uh, drafted and signed by the Ottawa Senators, played in the American League as a 20-year-old, a couple back surgeries uh, out of the game. And then uh, back at Dalhousie University, where I was going to complete a degree, started coaching there, then up to the Western Junior B Loop uh, under the tutelage of, of Whitey Stapleton, Pat Stapleton, who is no longer with us, but was a tremendous mentor of mine, and then caught on with the Bulls. And so back through a Belleville, and it's funny because I just got back from a reunion that we had up there that the, uh, the Belleville Senators, the American League team, was kind enough to put on. Uh, and there was 25 of us or so of alumni that, that had come back and everybody wore their Bulls jerseys and they packed the place. And it was kind of a neat thing. I don't think I saw five seconds of the game. It was all talking to people, little friends and old billets and teachers and, and uh, trainers and whoever else was, was, was kind of around. So it was a, it was a neat, it was really neat to get back to. I had 11 years in Belleville coaching and three years playing. So you're looking at 14 years. I think they said I was the longest employed Belleville Bulls, uh, <laughs> employee I guess uh, that had ever uh, been there for the organization so it was neat to have that but Belleville became very special to me for a number of reasons mainly the first one is when you're that young I was uh, late birthday 16 coming away trying to get used to that big move and stepping in on a team where they had three first rounders to the Leafs uh, on the, in the one year if you can remember back back in the 80 let's say uh, 89 draft, uh, Steve Bancroft, Scott Thornton, Rob Pearson. All right. So I'm walking in as a rookie from midget at East. And I, and I think I can, I have to be able to play like these guys someday, not in a million years. Did you ever think that, you know, so you go through your rookie year, you keep trying, you keep trying, you keep trying. And the good thing about junior hockey is there's an entry level, but there's an exit level. So the greatest players have to lead the league at some point. So you should expect yourself to improve as you move up the age groups because the big guys that were there last year are, have moved on. So, and I improved enough to get what I wanted. So, Yeah, you certainly did. Because I was thinking of that when you mentioned coming in as a rookie, oh, how would I ever perform like that? You, maybe to say you didn't have a sniff of 100 points would be a bit of an exaggeration. I think it was 72 in your second year, but you crack 100 convincingly with 113 points in your final year in the league. Yeah, first year, I don't know how long it took to get the first goal. And I mean... Did I ever go nuts when I got it? Somewhere around November or something. 
So um, really, really bad birthday for hockey, September 13th, the second worst birthday. You know, if I was two days later, I'm eligible for the next, for that 72 point year, right? With 33 goals or whatever it was, or 31 goals. Um, so I was out, I was eligible in my first year and, and not taken. Uh, second year, pretty good. And then third year, finally taken as a 19 year old, which is a little bit rare. But myself, Darren McCarty and Brent Gresky all followed that same path. We were all drafted as 19 year olds in the rule change year where you could take anybody at any time. So it was very fortunate for someone like me to even get drafted at that point because they, they had changed the rules. I remember that year, I played with a fellow named Andy Schneider in the American League uh, from out west, and he played World Junior. A significant part, good player, never drafted because of that rule change here where they said, because it used to be uh, top three rounds only, or if you're 17 or 18, starting in the fourth round, 19-year-olds would all get picked up. So you're looking at, if you're a good 19-year-old, you're looking at at least going, you know, fourth round, or maybe even sneaking into the top three anyways. So it was an interesting uh, way to go there, but it was it was fun to... Uh, to go through that whole progress. What was Belleville like as a place to play? It was, it was, it was actually supportive. Um, it was small enough of a scale that everyone cared, but also everyone knew what everyone was up to. So it, it you know, it keeps you on the straight and narrow, so to speak. Uh, an elite academic uh, advisor, Peggy Burse, who, you know, even when, it wasn't such a stress to go to school. You were going to school, you know, you were making sure you got your academics done. The billeting community there is outstanding. Um, you know, you really get a feel. Everybody knows who you are. You get that 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 feeling of that you're, you know, kind of important and they respect what you do. Um, yeah, it, it, it's a great spot for a junior team. I know that that the, the American League team is there and enjoying it too. If, they, if, they, if anything ever changed in that, in that front, They've done some significant improvements to the arena for that American League team. The, the Bell says it would it would be still a fantastic place to put a junior team if you ever you know if it, if the opportunity ever arose. So uh, you know it's too bad they couldn't work it out uh, at at that time. Um, but they did a lot of good work for the Senators when they came in. You know the, the community and 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 the, and the city I should say. Um, so it's there. There's a there's a there's a great situation there. Who knows the Senators may never leave. They may they may like it that much. <laughs> and why not, right? I always enjoyed it too when it was a stop on the yeah. OHL circuit, but it it must have broken your heart just a little bit, or more than a little bit, perhaps, when the team relocated to Hamilton. It was, and that was at the end of an eleven year stay for me. So we raised our boy there. He got came there. He just turned one when we arrived. So that's his hometown, and that's where he was. He was raised, and, and uh, yeah, it was it was it was it was interesting because people around town would even look at me a little bit and and, and like uh, look away, not make eye contact. Or, you know, because they felt so sorry for you. You know, you feel you felt like you were almost extinct. I know the franchise kept going and went to Hamilton, new name, new city, new everything. So it's, it really kind of ended when the Bulls ended when they left. So, um, yeah, it was odd for a while there. I felt people felt sorry for you if you were a longtime member of the Bulls. And and uh, it, it was it was an odd feeling. I mean, I don't certainly feel that now, especially after going back for that reunion. That was so, uh, so exciting. From the hockey standpoint, I always thought it was it, it's so unique uh, just watching games on that ice because, of course, you had the Olympic size at the old Yardman. What was it like playing there? There must have been a, a more distinct home ice advantage than in some other arenas. Okay, so the best home ice advantage of having Olympic ice, we firmly believed, was that other teams took it too seriously and tried to change too much coming into playoffs based on the big ice. Let's change our whole game plan. Let's, let's, uh, and it's like the first time they've ever played this way. And they're, and they're, they're just not playing well. And it has nothing to do with the ice. They're just, they're rattled by it. They've over, they've overthought it. And that's what we thought it was. I mean, obviously the puck possession game is, is, is more aligned. You could take a puck in the ozone and cycle and circle and cycle and, and reverse cycle, low to high, D to D. You could keep a puck there forever. And that was part of our game plan too, to demoralize teams by keeping them in their own zone for an entire shift type of thing. So there was lots of things to do. I mean, the defense can't be caught too far on the outside or taking runs wide for hits because in that case, you've got 
you know, your acquisition, they, you know, be back to that. So there are little things that we did all, all over. The, the best was, I think when I played, when I played, the measurements are supposed to be between the dots. So when you measure the ice surface, the face-off dots along the side, that's where you measure. And then if it's Olympic ice, you just get excess on the outside, outside the hash marks. You can see the excess outside the hash marks. Well, they used to measure the dots from the boards. So the dots were incredibly wide. It's a goalie landmark. We could go down the wing and, and rip low far post all day, especially on a team from the from the from the Western Conference just coming in. It wasn't, it was, it was kind of ridiculous. They eventually they made them make them change it based on complaints, but but they measured it incorrectly and the dots were nowhere near where they should have been. <laughs> so, oh, so I love it. <laughs> the opportunity you had there when it came to the coaching you received. Let's take them one at a time. Start with Danny Flynn for crying out loud. Danny, um, still a very close friend and mentor to mine today. One of the greatest guys in the game to me, coach at every level that there is. He now is a scout with Columbus. Um, a guy you can call right now and he'll provide you with two, three great drills or an idea on how to handle this or whatever. But we're a real super guy, real super guy. So, I mean, I was, I was, you know, I was, a constant scared to death rookie coming in that year that I had him. So he had more thing, more guys to work with, the bigger guys, the bigger guns and that. Um, he did take time and skill sessions to, to set me up in stations and work on this shot, work on that, work on whatever else. So, so Danny, yeah, Danny was awesome. And more importantly, still is uh, Larry Mavity was next. I mean, so I'm a very lucky guy to have been coached by Matt. Matt uh, had an extremely unique way to coach, um, always got a lot out of his players. His teams were always tough and honest. Um, so he he was a neat guy. I remember in uh, in that first year uh, with 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 Flinter, we had a playoff round, and that we, we set the longest game in OHL history at that time. It was a seven round series versus Kingston, our key rival. Um, I actually played the best hockey of my rookie year in that series. Next year, Matt was my coach. Uh, we're in exhibition. I think I body I was bodybuilding way too much back then. That's all we did. I had no hands, had no nothing, and we're in Cornwall playing. And uh, and he says, "Gramps, you don't start playing like last year. You're gonna be you're gonna be in a new home." <laughs> yeah, that was it. I started playing. I didn't want to get traded. Right? So I mean, just simple as that. He would just say things like that, and and, and you'd pay attention and. And we've lost math now, but what a what a tremendous character in the game. How much of their coaching yeah. style or what you learned from them do you adopt into your own coaching style today? Well, I love Mav's presence. And he didn't always have to speak. And he didn't always intimidate with fear either. But if he was starting to boil, you better listen. You know, you better not be, you know, you better be around. I, I got another one on him. Cardi, myself, and Fraser were into WWF wrestling. It's on TV. We just got TV in the room. It's on TV in the restroom. We got into it so much that we were late for practice. He comes in and and destroys the TV. Basically, <laughs> I guess I guess we better get on the ice, guys. You know, simple. Didn't say a word. Destroy him. You know, so little things like that. But anyway, his presence was was outstanding. I really like that. I like his communication skills. I like his charisma expected what he said and how he said it there was always a humor in there too to some degree you might have been afraid to laugh but it, 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 it was funny um then you know he had rules it, it was strange back then he had rules he had for some reason he had a rule and this is the old days don't get me wrong this is the old days this we're of age this is the old days his rule was no hard liquor but he saw you what he could be out having a beer out with the guys having wings if he saw you on hard stuff at all, you were in trouble. So I don't know that even a lot of coaches would have had that rule because guys would just run and do what they wanted to do back then, any night they wanted to. He actually had a rule on that, um, which was which was which made it interesting too because he, in his time and his time playing, he just may have seen too many guys get get lost in that. You know, uh, he never explained you know why he why he made a rule like that, he, and he had no such a rule. So he was neat. Danny Flynn. Uh, a technical guy, a positive guy, an energetic guy. 
So a little bit like Brian that way. So you, you'll never see the guy out of energy for hockey or life. Loves it. Loves everything. Full ideas. Always getting ideas from other people on that too. So he's, 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 he's progressed so well himself starting as a great coach anyways. Um, so that's what I think from him for sure. Out of curiosity, who was your favorite wrestler? Uh, well, I had to like Jacob Stink Roberts because of my name, but I didn't really <laughs> like him. Um, I like go way back for uh, 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 King Kong, Bundy, and Andre the Giant, Big John Stud. I like that era way back then where it was pretty simple. I it got pretty flamboyant as it moved on afterwards, but I like those guys. I got those wrestlers. I got those wrestlers at my mom's house still. They're big, giant rubber wrestlers with the ring. They're worth something. I'm going to check that out. Absolutely. I was a big Nature Boy Ric Flair fan, and I got oh, to interview him at one point in my career. <laughs> the heroes that he covered. So you could have, we could have, you could have grabbed him back when you were really young. He just covered every era. Yeah, he was special. That Mav story too, Jake, it makes me think that checks out because I had Sanaya Sapergi on this podcast some time ago, and she told the story about going to interview Mav in his office and having to kind of work her way around the beer cases to get to the desk, to sit down for a chat with the man. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean we when we get like my first road game, yeah, we we get on we get on the bus and you get handed your your a big bucket of KFC to, as a post game to share with a couple of guys and two beers, and that's your standard issue as you get on. You walk a little further and those beers are taken by the veterans, so you don't get them anyway. But <laughs> it, it's it it was just it was just the way it was, and uh, that's that's the presence he had for sure. My, how times have changed. Could you imagine a bucket of KFC as a post-game meal today? I don't know, but I want to. (laughs) (laughs) I take one a year. Well (laughs) said. (laughs) You you talked about earlier the the back injuries and, and the surgeries that led to the end of the playing career. It came so young for you, Jake. I mean, I I wonder at that point, well, two things, how difficult it was to, to acknowledge that, it's it's already over. And then hmm. what do you do and what's your mindset? Because I'm assuming you would have thought hockey was going to be around for a whole lot longer at that point. Oh, absolutely. Well, I mean, the strange thing is leading up to it, I had been number one in any fitness, even in, including both Senators camps that I was Ottawa Center camps I was healthy for in the fitness testing every single year. I had not missed a single game in junior hockey due to injury. And all of a sudden, and then my first year in the American League, I missed, I played 76 out of 80, but it was just four sitting out because you're a rookie. Um, so for four straight years of significant hockey, never missed a game due to injury. Was banged up, was hurt, whatever, but just not enough to miss a game. And then this stuff starts happening right when I'm supposed to be, you know, playing in Ottawa or starting my career. Uh, as a 20 year old, I didn't play over Asian Junior. As a 20 year old in the American League, I, Good numbers, everything's on track, no problem. I mean, whenever, even back in junior, when I was getting those big point totals, like 72 when I was 18, 113 it was when I was 19, I was also vote, voted best defensive forward and best checker in the coaching poll both years. So you got a best defensive forward and best checker like doing all these defensive polls and a face and key faceoff guy still able to, to score. So I, I really liked what I, where I could have been heading. But it was, yeah, so it was, it was really tough. It was tough to accept, tough to deal with. I was not in a good place at all. I was very bitter at everything. And really, really the only thing that got me going, I think, so I was even trying to go back to school at some point there and just doing, just couldn't believe where I was, you know, standing in the back of the classroom with a clipboard. So I couldn't sit because of the last back surgery, just, just writing at 24, 23, 24. What am I doing here on student loans? If you don't have a school package back then, don't have insurance, you don't have anything. So all of a sudden you think you're going to play in the National League or at least pro of some level your whole life, and you're sitting there with nothing. So, it, yeah, it, it was tough. And I, the kids now are taken much better care of. Everyone's got a school package to some degree. Uh, everyone's got insurance. I know this because of my, my young guy. Um, you know, so things have changed for the better for that. But I went from thinking I was having – a dream come true to, to absolutely nothing. So I guess one of my buddies, uh, Roddy Watkins, a retired police officer, invited me out to his AAA practice to work on face-offs. And I kind of just, first time he's parked up, I just kind of, oh, that was great. I loved it. So then I was able to, to coach at Dalhousie as a, you know, second, third assistant with, with Daryl Young and then Shane Easter. But Dalhousie University got coaching, finished my economics degree, was thinking of doing an MBA, just 
just liked the coaching way too much. Couldn't find anything else. The best thing in the world is being a player in hockey. The second best, I would say, probably is coaching. You're very much involved in the action. You have big responsibility. Um, and instead of giving everything to help yourself for your own career as a player, you almost have to be selfish in that way in your preparation and your training and, and how you can be the best you can be. Well, as a coach, you're helping 22 every year. So that's kind of the way I looked at it. That's kind of where it turned. And didn't go into business, didn't go into anything else other than, of course, hockey camps, teaching kids. That was a big part of it. And then went from uh, went from there. But that kind of recovered me. The hockey kind of recovered me uh, from the trouble, you know, from hockey, which was tough because I wasn't diagnosed properly off the start. And I was, it was a tough go. You know, it was a real tough go. And at the end of it, I'm a guy that's, you know, trying to walk again twice after two surgeries. The, the, the surgeries are fairly barbaric back then. And, you know, you just, what happened? Yeah, so it's a great question. It was tough. Um, I did come out of it. Still think about it, but I did come out of it. Was there an incident, Jake, that that triggered it? Was it one of those things where you're reaching, bending down to pick up a pencil and it goes on you? Uh, basically, yep. Yeah. Uh, I was just sitting on a bus once, but there had been damage before that. I had some trouble with groin. I set my second camp in Ottawa. I was slated to play every exhibition game. You know, things were on. I got through two, one against uh, the teams that aren't here anymore, one against Quebec, one against Hartford. Like I hit the post on Sean Burke and Hartford. Like I faced off against Sackett all night um, against Quebec. Cool stories, you know, the old, the old call side. Beat him all night, put me on for the last face off of the game, and he wins it for fun to, to Sunday for a one team. It's in the net. Like, oh, he just toying with me all night. What just happened? But anyway, so just, just, it was, it was fun, even yeah. that. So, but anyways, uh, developing some, some groin trouble, some hip trouble. Call it through maybe overplaying, but also let's look at the style of training that was going on back then. Stationary biking like crazy. Um, tightening up hip flexors. Um, flexibility, not a big factor. Yoga, not even existed for all. So all these things, I think, kind of added up to to hurt hurt my groins and 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 uh, and then it was overplay after that. Oh, you're, you'll get better in two weeks, no problem. You'll get better. You get better. You know, can you give us sixty percent if that's all you got? And it was all that stuff went on. So it just deteriorated for a while. So then, so once I was just sitting on a bus. And I went to get up, and this sharp sharpness goes right down to your foot, and your leg's gone, just like that. I really wasn't doing anything, but obviously there was enough pressure on discs in different situations because of the injuries and the imbalances. I remember one of my legs looked like a lobster with one big claw, one small claw. One of my legs was hardly helping me. It was just not working. So, um, so yeah, so that happened there. So then, that, then it became a significant back problem. Forget about the hips. And then it just adds up and adds up. You just, I just can't get out of it. It's too much to unravel. Um, tried my best for two, three years. But uh, I remember bringing coffees to great guys to let me on at six. Anything I could do, but it was not working. And then, yeah, so that's all I knew from there. But that's kind of how that, that happened. And then I had finally gotten out of the game. Uh, I started at Dalhousie. And a year into that, um, just started feeling it again in my back. Exploded again. No reason. Didn't even, wasn't even in athletics, wasn't even working out. It just needed more in that first surgery, maybe, maybe uh, an orthopod did it. Then I had a neurosurgeon the next time, brought in on a stretcher, wait for this neurosurgeon to come back. So I thought he did a fantastic job in the second surgeon. The second, I, was, I wasn't walking for, I'd put weight on, on my feet for probably close to a month. And then uh, when he was done, he told me to stand. I said, no way, no way. I'm not standing. There's no way because I can't stand it. it. Just you know that that shooting so feels like you're being electrocuted type thing. And then I just stood, foot dropped, and I stood. So I took some extra time, got everything out of there, got all the extra disc out of there, whatever. And wow. So so I'm a functional guy now. I can ride buses. Um, I can be. I can work out. I can skate. I can do these things all the right way they have to be done the right way there has to be some core involved they have to be some care about what you do uh, i can lift things but i just can't um it has to be done right if it's not done right i'll, I'll be in trouble so you know just the right way to lift and all that stuff and not stuff i don't lift. if i didn't doing weights now it's never the heavy stuff we don't need that anyways so, but that's how it kind of came about was that that type of route and, and now i'm fortunately i'm 
functional people I wouldn't even know I had a background. You know, it strikes me. We make we make a little joke about a bucket of KFC for a post game meal, but we also talk about insurance for the players, the education packages, the training that would include yoga that 30, 40 years ago, we would have looked at like you're from outer space. The game has come a long way in this time and, and very much for the better here, hasn't it? Absolutely. And the fitness guys are so keen. Um, you know, they're, they, they've done a lot. They've gone to school. They've done all their, they've done their degrees. They've done their training and they're enthusiastic, but they're not, it's not macho anymore. It's not how big can you get? How about the biceps? You know, those types of things. It's all streamlined. What do you really need for the game? So the hockey body has changed. The hockey body is not quite as bulky. Nowhere near as bulky as we were way back in the day. Slowing ourselves down. Ready for the one big hit that might happen for the game. But hurting you in every other way and maybe hurting you physically in terms of health goes and that, but no, right now the way the guys, they're lean, flexible, they understand their bodies, they stay on top of things. Trainers are with them all the time. The athletic therapists, you know, there's a little bit of a tightness here. Let's get it right now. It won't, we won't even let it grow a week. All right. Let's do these stretches and these pressure points and these, all that stuff. So it, it is a, it is a, that's really helped the guys. You'll never completely avoid injuries. And of course, in, in a physical sport, um, unnecessary injuries would have, would, are definitely down. You know, and I, I truly think that even though I don't feel, I feel I was overplayed when I was hurt and never had a chance to get better. And that's fine. But I do believe the type of training I did back then, because I did so much of it, took so much pride in it. It was the wrong training completely. That had a factor in it. So what was it that brought you back from home down east to maybe your adopted home in Belleville to coach alongside a guy named George Burnett there with the Belleville Bulls? Absolutely. George and I had an interesting history. Um, for two years, I was in Belleville. He was in Niagara Falls, right? So we, we did cross over there a little bit. Um, let me see if I can, if I can uh, remember it all here now. But he was coming on board to Belleville. I was interested. Uh, we met, I think it was supposed to be a bit of an interview, but it was more of a conversation and things just really did click kind of right away. So, um, yeah, how much I can credit him for my career is incredible. He got me to Belleville, learned from a guy, learned things from a guy I would never learn from anybody else as far as how he runs an organization, how as far as he handled every single, single situation you could ever find for, for a player or kids. You know, if you have... You have a young guy going to the league. Uh, you got you want him to to play in George Pence organization, no question. Um, so learned an absolute ton from him. When the Bulls left, and that was eleven years, we're very close. So when the Bulls left, um, he went to Hamilton with them. I had an opportunity in Peterborough, so I was two years in Peterborough. Second year, we we were went, we got to the conference finals. We won the conference regular season. A great year. Um, Steve Lawrence was on that team. Some of the other types of, of guys that were, they had, Mike put a good, real good, strong team together, Mike Oak. Um, and then George was landing as well. Uh, in a bit of a surprise, he wasn't sure he wanted to be, he was going to be the manager, but then they wanted him to coach. And then he said, listen, I know you're happy there. You know, you know and, and, and went through Mike Oak and everything. And then we worked out a situation so I could uh, join him in Guelph. Okay, so one year in Guelph, working through the kinks, the team was maybe the, Maybe the last place in the league the year before. Second year in golf, things are going a little bit better. All the draft picks are all looking good. People are doing well. And then here comes the deadline. And I, the deals he made that year, I've never seen anything like it. I don't even know if he had. But what he does is he's he's awake at he's awake early and he's on his phone as long as anybody else is awake. 8 a.m. until it's time to shut it down and get some sleep. So he, he, he knew the market. He knew, you know, everything about who was available, who might come available, who would need. He just studies, studies, studies. A little bit of a computer that way. Um, and the boys came available from Owen Sound. And he got them. He just was able to get them. You know, that team was, was, was incredible. I think there's nine of them that have already played a game in the National Hockey League. 
and there'll be more. I might be wrong, I might be 10 now, but that's incredible. That wasn't that long ago. 2019 was not that long ago. You know, and, and guys are, I mean, Suzuki, obviously the biggest impact. John Dursey, great in LA. These would be the two leaders of it, but, but, but seven other guys have played at least one game nationally since then. It was an incredible team. Things they did to, for the comebacks in the playoffs that year, epic. Just epic. Yeah, I, I was going to ask about that because I, I remember that deadline so well. And just as somebody covering the league, I'm like, wow, George found a few rabbits and some hats over there to build up this team. But that playoff run, Jake, you sweep Kitchener in the first round and then the magic just starts to happen. You spot London three, come back from three, nothing down. You're down three, one to sag. And I think you dropped the first two to Ottawa in the conference final two, or in the OHL final too. But particularly with London, you're down three, nothing. There's not a hope in hell. And yet you come back. What was that playoff run like? Here, what we, here's what we thought. Well, in the first round against Kitchener, they had, if you remember, the best power play in the league. And it hurt us all year. And our guys put their minds to it. We created something that we thought would work. And it really, really worked. And that helped with, with Kitchener because the guys were able to adapt. Um, in London, when it had gotten to 2 nothing, to 3 nothing. We just felt at our own minds because we have not played well. We can't be going down and not even showing our stuff. We have not played well. Let's play a good game and see what happens. So 4-1, 2-3, and then anyways, the game, let's go right through to game seven because they're all close. In game seven where they're in the place is packed and it's, you know, historic type stuff if we come back and win it there in London. And at some point, I we didn't feel like we could do much as as coach if we couldn't hear anything. Um, it was just one of those things where the players are going to win this if they're going to win it. And Suzuki and Ratcliffe, two London boys, took over, maybe in and around the second period to the rest of the game, and took over. And yeah, I've never felt more. I don't think helpless is the word, but unneeded as a coach in my life. It was surreal. For those guys to actually come back and get that win. And I know the, the boys on the other bench weren't happy. They didn't come see us. Um it was it was incredible. Then we go down two and Saginaw to Saginaw, down two nothing, down three one. And once our guys got going in the series, you could see you could start to see a bit of fear. And we were huge. We were a massive team. You could start to see a bit of a concern in our opponents once our guys started going. We always gave up too early, three early. And then they'd come rolling back and say, oh, no, here we go again type feeling. That was starting to develop in teams that we play, that we came back on. Um, in, into Ottawa, Ottawa was uh, – they beat us in the first two, and they were 14-0 and in playoffs. And they ended 14-4 and because we were able to come back and win four after that. It was crazy. It was just, it was just unreal. That was a confident, good team. Um, we had, we, had, we had advantages with size and things, and I think we had a quiet confidence that it didn't matter if we were down or some teams may worry because we've already come back so many times. And so we just kept kept going, kept going. And, um, yeah, that was a pretty amazing feeling. We were able to finish that one off at home. Yeah, I just uh, – I don't know if I'll ever see that again. That's so many comebacks, right? You must have felt, though, not, not only with the comebacks, but then the destination – for the Memorial Cup, you're going back home to Nova Scotia. This is like the stuff of destiny, Jake. Didn't even didn't even let myself think about it. Really? Didn't even let myself think about it. And all of a sudden, when we got it, and it was time to go. And it was I mean, the Ottawa series was cool. We were both flying back and forth, both teams, and it was you know, planes were all set up with power bars and I mean, anything you might need that's healthy. It was it was a neat it was a really neat thing. And then all of a sudden, we're on a plane to the Halifax. So that was good. All kinds of great people to see there, all friends. And, and um, that's an epic arena. It used to be called uh, Metro Center, now it's Scotiabank. Uh, yeah, that was that was pretty amazing. Lots of family. Um, incredible, incredible week. And uh, yeah, we're right there with anybody. You know those tournaments are, you never know how to get on, you know, get out on top on those tournaments. A lot of things have to happen and not happen for you to, for you to do it. But uh uh, we definitely proved ourselves as a seven-game series team. Um, 
so that's just one game at a time, different opponent. You know, there's a lot of things that were a little bit different, of course, but uh, but being there was neat. That's pretty pretty neat. And then, of course, there was some interest to, to come out and coach the Quebec League and Cape Breton as well, which which was a, was happening as the series playoffs were going on. But then you, it couldn't get any better. Here I am right in their backyard coaching for a Mem Cup. So it sort of pieced together that way too. But awesome to be playing in front of uh, family in that setting. Absolutely. When you mentioned Ottawa and they beat you those first two games, so they're 14 and 0 in the playoffs at that point, they finish 14 and 4 because you take the next four. I'm thinking back a little more than a decade earlier. Now we're back with the Belleville Bulls, and I'm thinking of the 08 OHL final. And you're mm-hmm. up against a Kitchener team that came into the series against you in the Belleville Bulls, 12 and 1. And we're suddenly 15 and 1, and we're on the brink of history. Nobody's gone 16 and 1 through the playoffs, but they finished 16 and 4 because you came all the way back in that one, too, to force a game seven. What do you remember about that OHL final and that comeback? That was just bit by bit, baby steps, you know, how to eat an elephant one one bite at a time type stuff, similar to that Saginaw, uh, that London series. And uh, let's just keep playing. And that's, I think, the kind of tone that, that George has on his teams. Um, there isn't a too high or a too low. There's a let's go to work and let's be real good every single night and let's control our thoughts. Often he doesn't say a lot. He, 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 he believes that you can say so much sometimes that you just send the guys thinking off on different patterns and tangents or whatever else that they might be interpreting what you're saying for. Just keep it simple. So when you're in a tough situation uh, and you're keeping it simple like that, you can still execute. You can still play. You're not worried. Um, those type of things. So we crept back and then they got real angry at us, game seven and thumped us, I think. But to get the game seven of the league finals, good. that was awesome. We'll take that. We were very deserving of being in that Memorial Cup if you can get the game seven against the, the league champs. You talked about those players that were on that 2019 Guelph team. I know, I'm pretty sure this guy wasn't on your 08 championship team or championship run team with Belleville, but you did coach well with the Bulls. P.K. Subban, what was that like? Yeah, yeah, he would have been there. PK was He awesome. would have been there, yeah. PK, PK came in um, four years with us. Um, he was a way later pick than he should have been. Oh, I think we got him in the sixth round. For a while there in Belleville, everyone we picked in the sixth round went pro. And one year we had four six-rounders. They were all outstanding. We were going to trade second-rounders for six-rounders. <laughs> second-rounders were, were struggling. But he was one of those guys. Eric Ten Grady, another six rounder. Nick Pajot, another six rounder, still playing pro. Uh, Mark Canton played the National League for a bit, six rounder. I, I don't know how, I don't know how, how it happened, but it's just it. So he was he was one of a bunch of six rounders that we took that year. Uh, he showed up, um, you know, and, and just was a little bit better offensively than we thought. He got some early opportunity. Um, he just worked his way into the league, and for he and I, because I coached defense. I knew what he needed. He's got to show. Can he, I always want guys to do this. Can you show you're complete by the time your draft comes up? Like, are you not just one dimensional or are you lacking anything? Can you do everything? And that's defensive. That's everything that every part of the game. Can you be complete? And he, he, he believed that too. And he worked through that and he got to that level. And that's why he was a sec. I think it was a second rounder to Montreal. Comes from a tremendous family. We had both boys after him as well, Malcolm and Jordan. And um, still to Bell as well because he had a great experience. So they wanted to come as well, and um, and yeah, he was he was awesome. He wanted to compete and win so bad. Great personality, one of the best guys for PR, obviously, still is right. Tremendous guy, tremendous guy. You had the yeah. chance also, Jake, to coach internationally with the U17s at the World Hockey Challenge, and uh, what is it? Three golds and and a silver come from your time yeah. doing that for, what's the nod yeah. mean to get that opportunity for starters yeah for four years straight i don't know if any, any country or region or we call ours as ours was regional i guess even though some were provinces quebec and ontario were on their own and that was a neat way to do it back then that was a lot of fun um i don't know if that level of success was there rob kittamira ran our program um had some great coaches as well um 
And you talk about players that are coming through and playing for Team Ontario. I mean, I, I was messing around the other day, and I, there's 84 guys that I had a chance to coach that have played at least one game in the National Hockey League. And a lot of them come right out of that under-17 program. I mean, it just, you know, Ryan O'Reilly, uh, Dougie Hamilton, you know, whatever. I can't even remember them all, but there's, there's you know, they're outstanding, Sean Monaghan. So to be able to work with those guys, I guess what I took from that is I knew I knew then I was a coach that wasn't going to, that could go, that could, that could work with stars. I wasn't going to ever hold back stars, direct them, work with them, coach with them. But if you've got stars like that and they're underachieving, that's always an issue for any coach, for any organization. You got to be, your guys have to be maximizing. So how do you create the environment? Uh, how do you create the lines? How do you create rules? How do you create your practices? Whatever it is where guys can actually maximize and maybe even overachieve. So, you know, I developed, I had some great players, of course, in, in Belleville prior to that, but but uh, to go through and, and, and beat Team USA in front of 14,000 in Winnipeg or in front of, uh, you know, year 11, your classic nine or 10 in, in London, um, we played together year round, and the names that were on that team we played against are, I mean, epic. So that was wicked. I was thankful for that. Jason Jason Brooks had got me into it to begin with. He had developed in a way that he he, he couldn't do the jobs anymore because he was off to the Guelph being coach and GM, and you know. So yeah, that was awesome, and I'll never forget just the style of player and just you know how do you handle that many good players. Who's on the fourth line? Is there a fourth line? Who's on the power play? You know, all those uh, little things were involved. It was a tremendous experience. You know, you, you make me think to some of the conversations we have around the the world juniors, the under twenties, from time to time, and and you're you're bringing in this collection of absolute studs. Let's be honest, and you have to find a way to get them to fill a role. That can't be the easiest thing to do. Mm -hmm. And whether you quite get them there or not, you still have to ask everybody to play at least this certain way. Even if you're on the first line, you need to be a, a responsible guy as well. So um, I guess in my situation, I, I didn't have, if there was a first line, they weren't playing a whole lot different than the third line. They weren't, you know, the, the third line wouldn't be completely defense. First line wouldn't be completely offense. We had a way to play, and this is our way to play. And so everybody did a bit of everything. So re defensive responsibility was expected. Um, offense was expected from the third liners, fourth liners, uh, that type of thing. And that's, you know, not a lot of time in the under 17 to, to get going. You get your team, and you get about a week or so to get rolling, and then a couple exhibition games, and then you're in. So... Yeah, I mean, some pretty pretty good players now. Looking back, late third line. So, so it's just just the, and some weren't on power plays. So they're in the NHL. It just you do what you think you can do at that time. They're 16 years old. Nobody knows they're superstars in the NHL. Nobody, they don't have 15 year NHL careers yet. So you do what you can with it, and you just try to manage it and and um, and make sure your communications are strong and. Make sure it's positive and, and all those types of things. But yeah, I, I tried to get away from that a bit. Some guys naturally came with those skills. So so uh they 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 naturally you just saw them. I really want this role. I really want this job of shutting down a team. And and if you had it, then that's easy. Sure. You can you can uh Tom Wilson, for example, uh had in uh, uh up in Winnipeg, and this guy with the leadership of this guy. Well, it's unreal. He had banged up his wrist, couldn't shoot, was still playing, just played defense. Somehow in the finals, in, in, in the final game, ends up on a breakaway. Can't do anything. Waits to get hacked, earns the penalty shot. Okay, earns the penalty shot. Go back to the bench, and uh, Campania was the guy. So I, I'm, I'm back there, and I'm saying, I have no idea who, who to pick here. And it has to be one of the guys on the ice. And the boys were all saying, Campania, Campania. So I put him in play the Sudbury. So I put him, I just did a quick 
shuffle took one guy off, put him off, and then and then okay, you can only have these guys. And he said 14. All right, 14, you go. So we got this, this guy, and he he scored. He was one of the first guys to to do, and he did it in this game in front of fourteen thousand. Uh, that epic, uh, leave the puck behind you, backhand laid in type of thing, hard to describe. But and guys still do it kind of today. But but at that point in twenty eleven, it wasn't being done yet. He does that, but Wilson creates all that. Right, he creates all that. Like that's just the type of selfless guy he, I'm sure, still is. I know exactly the play you're talking about. You described it perfectly. And I, I wonder about those medals, Jake. Do you keep them anywhere special? Yeah, I've got them around. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of moves, a lot of moves lately for me. So they are around. You know, you got a ring every time. It's nice to have rings. Um, three from from World Under 17, one from Guelph as well. And and uh yeah, I'll always they're they're always gonna be in a in a special spot. I think they helped me sell a house once, honestly. I I, I displayed them in the basement. And the guy coming through was a hockey guy. And I like to think that maybe that was strategic. Maybe that was a, that was real good staging on my part. So he was a hockey guy and I had to, I had to stop out anyways. Probably had nothing to do with it, but I, I, I thought it might. That makes me think of something else. You know, we talk about this coaching career, this hockey life of yours, without really stepping back sometimes and thinking about all of the different places that you travel to live in even for a while it doesn't change a whole heck of a lot as a coach how difficult does that make it for a family well especially when you're injured when i was younger and when i was injured and trying to work with doctors in toronto trying to work with doc- with people you know anywhere else and as far as small moves that were considered moves even as, as a young age because of all that i added it up once and it was unbelievable i couldn't believe it I couldn't believe how many times I've changed venue or had to come back to, to the same venue or work back and forth and, and whatever else. It was hard to believe. You just shove everything in your car and go. Um, yeah, yeah, it, 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 is, it is hard to believe. And, and you, you know, you do get to a point where you want to saddle it down a little bit, of course. So what was it that brought you back kind of full circle here? If we started coaching at, at Dow and now here you are at Waterloo. What brought you always, back? always respected youth sports and, and the university. It's it's where I started coaching. And I loved the the maturity level and you know the, the focus of the player at that level. I mean they're not they're not coming in at 18 or 19 or 20 like other university athletes. These guys finish their junior, wherever it may be. So they're coming in at 21. So the age of the guys is 21 to 26, let's say. Um they're smart. They're great to deal with. They're, they're men, you know, so it, it is like a miniature pro league. The league I can tell you is faster than the CHL. Um, and, you know, you, what you'd be missing is those one, two guys per team that are going pro or to the national league or one, two or three, you know, everybody else that's played in the O or Q, they, they all end up there because the school packages are excellent and they're doing the right thing. And then they're coming that way. So, yeah, it's been it's been really neat. It's been um, it's been a lot of fun. It's been great to work with them. I, I tell people that I've coached more this year in a shortened season. They, they don't play near as much as I would normally in a full season of junior because you identify something that you know the team needs to work on or an area the team needs to work on. You talk about it. You show the video. You have to work on a practice, and they do it. Oh, great. Okay, I don't have to get I don't have to be on guys for half a year to get this system or to get this style player to get this whatever we're doing. They do it and then you move on to something else. You know, they're just they're just those types of guys. And of course, you know, you Brian was a big attraction to Brian, Brian Bork, who I, I grew up with out east and and have worked with consistently since the amount of Bellable Bulls players, for example, that, you know, we kind of cooperated and got his way over the years. Or you know, was an awesome number and a, lot, and a lot of great players. And I just knew his experience level. If I'm thinking about that level, what a guy to work with. There, there probably isn't a better guy to work with. He's the associate athletic director as well. Knows takes care of 22 other teams. Knows everything about everything with with esports and and Canadian University. So yeah, so all that kind of kind of added up together. And yeah, it is nice to have a hockey job that has pension benefits and tuition for your family. And, you know, that's unheard of too. Right. So, um, neat, 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 uh, 
needed managers to be in there. And yeah, it's a, it's a different brand of coaching for sure. What makes it different? Do you have to approach it differently? Um, just, just the, just for me, how, how fast they can process. So my first practice, for example, and, and Brian's got multifaceted drills that this is going on. That's going on. I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I don't even know what's happening. I can't, I can see it on the board when we go out, but these guys know it and they can do it. It's just uh, more cerebral. It's just more intelligent. You don't have to spend as much time on each girl. They just do it and it's done and, it's, and you can move on. So all those things were, were just a little bit of a, and just raw pace and practice. On it. it sounds, uh, whether people believe that or not, but the raw pace of practice and games is higher than the CHL. So there's some, there's some adaptation. I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine now. It's fine after a couple of weeks, let's say, but for a while there, I was spraying my neck in practice, trying to, trying to figure out what was going on. And, and I'm a, a veteran of many, many years. So it's, it's a good league. I wonder, Jake, how much of the coaching is on the hockey side and, and maybe how much, if any, is on the life side of things for these players in youth sports. Because when I think about the education packages now, and we've talked about them a couple of times here on this show, but I think about players doing that. If they're not going to go to the NHL right away, get that education, and then there's a there's a whole world of opportunity for you out there in hockey once you have your education under your belt is there any of that kind of conversation that happens well at at this point and 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 i and i i do believe you know the teams or the leagues in the chl have taken care of their players the youth sports teams and schools are also contributing um it's it, it's almost going to need to be a very good pro situation for you not to go to school if you've been someone who cares about your marks I mean, anything can happen out of it. Dan Walker, we just had for two years here. So I was here with us last year. Dan was a, a guy that mainly fought in the OHL with Oshawa and North Bay. I think Stan brought him into the league in North Bay way back. And that's what his role was. Came, came, came to uh, U Sports at Waterloo and brought and Brian's got skill sessions every day where, where they can come out if they, they need to. I'll be out there. We have two other skills coaches that, that are out there. And he came to all those. And there's no fighting in the league. So there's zero expectation to fight. So he developed so quickly that he became the best player on the club, 6-6, and was leading scorer. And uh, Tampa flew in three times this year, assistant GM mm-hmm. Tampa, three out to look at him, and he signed a two-year deal with the American League. So if you really want to put to it, like what I like to say to the guys when we're recruiting is, you got myself and Brian, two skills coach, unlimited ice. We like to think we want to prepare you for pro job as well. So when you come out and you know you're going to be probably ready because the school and water schooling in Waterloo is so good for a career, but we also want you ready to to, to potentially play pro. So so there's a, there's a and the leagues have just gone through the roof because of the school packages because of the continued competitiveness of youth sports to try to access more funding for the players when they come in, and it's it's just become a real strong league and lots of guys are still going pro and guys in Waterloo can. We've had two guys in Waterloo this year turn down pro because their careers are just going to be so much better right away. You know, they want to start their career. So and that's fine. But they had an option. They, they, they you know, they, 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 they developed to the point where there was pro interest. So, and with Dan, Dan, uh, Dan, <laughs> Dan uh, develops a new player, doesn't fight in four years. And his first game has two fights, one at center ice, he's six, six. He fought that, fought a, fought a six, nine guy, did really well, raising, Doing all this, and his girlfriend plays. His girlfriend plays at Waterloo as well. She's a real good player for the women's team, and she just was devastated. Oh no, not again! He's not just going to like this. It was everybody and his parents all really was really happy that he learned to play hockey uh, the right way. And uh, and yeah, so we're hoping he it isn't just that, but he just couldn't. He just couldn't hold back. So and he did okay. Certainly didn't get hurt, and he certainly decisioned on both sides. I think. How reassuring was it for you, Jake, to have a guy like Brian Bork at the program that you're joining at Waterloo? I mean, you guys basically grew up in hockey together. That's right. So for for Brian and I, and I've always had a ton of respect for him, he really hasn't changed. He's just gotten better and better and better and better his whole whole life as far as everything he does. But uh, we played against each other in minor hockey, really didn't like each other. Um, 
with Triple A because competitiveness, right? Triple A, we both got together on the same team, became friends, both drafted to the Belleville Bulls together. Um, back then, lots of rounds. He was a later pick out of uh, out of Dartmouth and and Triple uh, A, and um, he actually got in there and made the, made the team. They wanted to keep him as a late pick because he played so well, and but they wanted him to start in tier two, Wellington, I believe it was. And he decided against that. And he went back, went to Dalhousie University, and I think he's completed his third degree. I know he's got a master's in coaching. Um, it just, yeah. Even if I wasn't thinking about moving on in hockey, just it's it's just it's just really good development for me to to be with a guy that can do so much basically in a day, and still be a great guy the whole day, and not really you know sleep a ton either. He just he doesn't need much sleep. You know, he, he and he's up early and he's he's a he's a pretty he's a pretty good role model. I like what he's done. He's got four daughters as well, and, and they're all. Great and doing well, and you know he's done a lot of great things. All these years, Jake, all these stops. What keeps you going? What is it about coaching that still lights a fire in your belly? Relationships, for sure. Relationships with players. There isn't a player I, I have I've coached in my entire career that can't give me a call at any time, or I can't touch base with them at any time. You know, and, and, and it runs up and by me or just, hey, I'm at the game. Tell them I'm at the game. See you after, um, you know, up there, up in Belleville at the reunion. I had um, Igor Sokolov in uh, in Cape Breton. Fantastic year we had together. It was an unbelievable year. And um, he got drafted as a 19-year-old second round to Ottawa. And so he's in Belleville trying to work his way up. But anyway, so after the game, obviously, you get a chance to say hi to him. Kevin Mandelisa, another guy I had in Quebec who's uh, in the Quebec League who, who is up and down with Ottawa playing. He's a goaltender, of course. And then, um, so I just, I, I like that the best. I like, I like bench work. I like, I like tight games um, and just helping in whatever way you can make certain calls, say certain things to somehow, I mean, wins and losses are just so close that sometimes you can't even go back and find out what really was the turning point. Um, but it's a neat feeling when you've had to work hard for a win and you get that win and you're shaking, you know, your, your coach's hands and the guys are pumped. That stuff's pretty awesome. Is there a spot on the resume that still needs to be filled out? I don't know yet. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see what direction uh, everything goes and, and um, we will see because it's, uh, yeah, there's a bit of a turning point situation. You know, am I trying to get more involved uh, with these sports as well? And um, and then, of course, to keep my eyes on a number of other things and, uh, at the same time. So um, I, I've never set big goals for myself as a coach. I want a coaching job and I love coaching. So that's kind of the, always the way I've been. It certainly sounds that way. And this has been uh, a ton of fun to just talk some hockey get your perspective on things, hear some of those stories. Thanks a ton for making the time to sit down with me. Awesome. I enjoyed it.